I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater. We host the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services each semester. Uh, we uh, host 10 to 12 lectures that focus on a theme. And this year's theme, I'm sorry, this spring's theme is Native America. We have 10 lectures for you, and, and this one's our second. Um, today's speaker is Rosie Ivanova. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Languages and Literatures at UW. Whitewater, but she earned her PhD in Europe at the University of Warwick in the UK. She teaches and researches in two different areas, effective and culturally sensitive pedagogies for international ESL students and contemporary American Indian literature and socio-cultural issues. She sees her research and teaching practice as connected and enriching each other, and she regularly teaches English courses for international students, as well as a course in American Indian literature, including a Fulbright appointment to teach these two topics in her native country of Bulgaria a few years ago. Please welcome Rosie Ivanova. Thank you, Kiri, and thank you all for being here today uh, to hear my talk. Uh, I just want to make sure, do I sound all right? Other than the accent, obviously. <laughs> a little bit louder. OK, I'm a little soft-spoken. I always think that. So thank you so much uh, for being here to hear my talk on the topics of Manifest Destiny, a US popular culture, and American Indians. And please let me know if I need to speak up. Maybe you can signal. Um, I'll try to pay attention. I am not a fan. I'm not a fan of mics, but um, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll remember to speak up. So um, um, for me, um, the starting point of this presentation um, uh, with all these big topics uh, came actually from a t-shirt. In fact, uh, my original title for this pre presentation was not Manifest Ignorance, uh, but rather um, a t-shirt story. Um, and um, But I obviously changed it because I thought, People may not be interested in t-shirts. <laughs> um, but what I meant um, with this t-shirt uh, story is not just any uh, plain black number, uh, but this particular one. Um, and this is a t-shirt that uh, was released a little over five years ago, September 2012, uh, by Gap, a major retailer company uh, for fashion clothing. Um, our students are very familiar with this retailer. Um, and um, as you can see, um, uh, this t-shirt particularly is showing the slogan, Manifest Destiny. Um, it was advertised as the at the time as showcasing Gap's best new menswear designers in America. And the t-shirt designer was Mac uh, McNeary. So um, why do I want to talk about this t-shirt? Um, first of all, um, uh, it was, again, uh, attracted a lot of fashion atten uh, attention. Um, and um, in addition, the, uh, the designer additionally um, advertised his product with a tweet um, that um, actually um, attracted a lot of um, negative attention. The tweet was, as you know, today we probably know about tweets. Uh, they attract a lot of negative attention often. Um, the tweet was manifest destiny, uh, survival of the fittest. Um, this tweet was considered so offensive that, uh, that, uh, that it since has been deleted uh, less than a couple of weeks after it appeared. Uh, but here you see it um, screen grabbed uh, from a Facebook page. Um, and then I was actually able to verify its existence because it was uh, still available on the online pages of the Huffington Post and the Guardian, who at the time reported on the problem. So what? Why do I want to take your beautiful afternoon um, to talk about the t-shirt? Why does this artifact of US popular culture merit a presentation? Uh, in a Native America-themed series. Um, well, as you can imagine, um, the t-shirt attracted um, controversy uh, and comments and protests from activists, scholars, and consumers, both American Indian and otherwise. But uh, the, the protest was spearheaded by the Native American community, as um, you can imagine. And some of the uh, controversy at the time um, is revolved around this phrase of uh, manifest ignorance. Um, a, a publisher, the, the, the 
Jim, James Mackey, by the way, I studied with him in England, that's why I kind of followed um, his story, but uh, The Guardian, which is a UK newspaper, was the one to extensively publish on this issue, and the author at the time call, called this um, T-shirt a historical mistake and an ignorant provocation. And he continued, the fact that such an item could go on sale at all speaks volumes about Euro-America's ignorance of its history with the continent's original inhabitants. And this was, he was writing about uh, a month after the t-shirts released in October 2012. Um, in the US, Indian Country Today, as you know, a Native American publication, um, also kind of um, suggested that um, the existence of a t-shirt like that by a major retailer also speaks volumes of um, ignorance, both of consumers, of Americans, of um, popular consumers of culture. Um, and the comment at the time was, um, I doubt there was mal malicious intent behind this t-shirt. In fact, I think it was just ignorance. Again, suggesting that um, the designer, the company, the major retailer just didn't know what they were doing when they were putting that slogan. And um, we will talk about why, you know, why this kind of merits a discussion. The problem with the term manifest destiny, as many of you may know, is that this term has two narratives or two stories behind this. So this t-shirt story kind of multiplies. It has two stories behind it. In the U.S. popular culture, in the U.S. history books, um, in U.S. Uh, major mainstream education, we think of the theme uh, and the term manifest destiny as a term that highlights the uniqueness and greatness of the United States and of its historical experience as an example, as, uh, as a manifest um, um, example of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a good adventure. Of a, of a moral responsibility, of political responsibility, and I'll talk about this in details. Um, it's a narrative that, this is a phrase that captures uh, the narrative of a making of a country, of uh, the stretching of the United States from shore to shore. And this is the story that is popular, the story that we like to tell, tell the story that sounds um, reassuring, good, national, uh, something that we feel, feel proud of. The story that is hidden, and the story that we don't know much about is the story from an Indian perspective. Um, and to Indians, as um, Kim Tilson Braveheart wrote in Huffington Post in 2012 in connection to this notorious t-shirt, um, as she said, the phrase manifest destiny for Indians calls to mind a brutal history against native people, especially since the founding of the United States. Lauda, oh, so I'm so sorry. Um, um, I don't know what to do with this. I'll try to speak up. Thanks, thanks for letting me know. <coughs> so what is this ignored narrative um, uh, that, uh, uh, again, we are talking about? Um, and I am bringing here quotes from other Native American um, activists and folks who protested this t-shirt. Um, one of these posted by uh, Renee Roman Nose, who was kind of the activist and uh, Native American actress who was behind the movement um, and the indigenous action media who started the protest against this t-shirt, um, uh, continued to kind of write around that vein. She said, manifest destiny was the catchphrase which led to the, which led to the genocide of millions of my people, millions of indigenous people throughout this country. And she's the one who started the petition at um, change.org petition, um, arguing that the t-shirt, <coughs> the, the, the t promotes a belief that um, has resulted in the mass genocide of indigenous people. It serves to romanticize oppression. Um, again, if you are interested in the topic and want to search online, um, you probably will find many of these phrases in relation to that. I'll skip that <coughs> and maybe I'll return to that um, um, in a moment. So um, what is the history behind this manifest destiny phrase that has obviously two very conflicting stories? <coughs> the story that we probably know, the story that we often teach, um, the story that I learned even as a student in England and in Bulgaria, back in Europe, uh, starts with um, one of the examples in um, American literature uh, from John Winthrop, his sermon, um, 
titled A Model of Christian Charity, um, where he kind of talks about manifest uh, destiny in the context of um, um, Christian virtue as something as Puritans uh, brought to um, the new shores escaping corrupt Europe. He said, our manifest destiny is um, something that, um, as he says, we must consider that we shall be a city upon a hill. Uh, the eyes of all people are upon us. Um, and again, that idea that manifest destiny is kind of a model uh, for um, Christian virtue. <coughs> That idea continued again through uh, the mainstream history and the kind of the mainstream literature that um, we teach in the canon of American history, in the canon of American literature, repeated in Thomas Paine's Common Sense, one of the major examples of literary uh, political treaties, again, um, appearing at the time of the American Revolution to justify the separation of the United States from Great Britain at the time. And in Common Sense, Thomas Paine writes, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. The birthday of a new world is at hand. And here you can see again that uh, he talks about the manifest destiny, the destiny of the United St States as a, as a model um, of a better society and government. Um, uh, in a sense, uh, the idea is that America is destined to provide a model for social and political or organization that is different from the tyranny of the monarchy, in this case, represented at the time by Great Britain. Um, and so far, um, these two models of manifest destiny definitely merit um, um, admiration, in a sense. We see um, they define um, the purpose of um, the United States of America around the ideas of um, moral responsibility as well as political responsibility in these two major texts. So um, I'm coming to actually um, the controversial uh, point in this way, the term manifest destiny uh, also historically and in the literature that we study um, has been used often as, um, as a claim to land, as, as a as claiming right to territory and as a justification of the, of the country's, the United States territorial expansion. And again, I, um, that's, I guess that's what um, countries do. But kind of sweeping through history relatively quickly, um, uh, the, the term actually manifest destiny indeed was used for the first time officially in 1845, but John O'Sullivan, who was an editor and columnist, um, again, um, but somebody in the U.S. popular culture at the time, um, who at the time advocated adding, adding Texas to the United States. Um, and if you remember history, uh, Texas was annexed at that year. And he was saying, uh, he was arguing that the fulfillment of our manifest destiny is to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. And that's um, kind of where the term originated, directly connected, again, to the idea of uh, territorial expansion. And I have here on the map um, just kind of a reminder at the time of the different territories that were in the United States and um, kind of the Mexico territories uh, <coughs> are the one that he was um, talking about down there south. Um, Talking about manifest destiny, um, John O'Sullivan also wrote about, um, made cl claims to historical innocence. Writing in that same piece at the time, um, he also argued that, and I'm quoting, it is our unparalleled glory that we have no reminiscence of battlefields, but in defense of humanity, of the oppressed of all nations. And he uh, continues, our annals describe no scenes of horrid carnage where men were led on by hundreds of thousands to slay one another. So he basically is saying that uh, American history is very, is relatively peaceful, that American history does not have battle, battles, that American history is not um, marred by blood and crime. And in a sense, um, this is the story that um, we 
like to tell. This is the story that is often taught, and this is the story that dominates our popular imagination, uh, the history of the United States. And this is the story that led to a t-shirt that proudly announces on its front by a major retailer during a recession when people should really research their slogan ve slogans very carefully at the time. Uh, this led to a t-shirt that proudly advertises manifest destiny. And one would ask, well, why can't we be proud about that? Uh, let's give us details of the other side of that dual story. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem always comes from, um, like in everything, that um, it comes from the dangers of telling one single story. In addition to the story of the United States, the history of the United States, we also have the indigenous people history of the United States, um, a new book released uh, relatively recently by a Native American writer, the indigenous people history of the United States, and I can pass this around start doing the rounds, my show and tell. This is the history that we don't know, and it's the history that I would like us to touch today. Um, <coughs> so the doctrine of the manifest destiny um, for that indigenous people's history of the United States certainly um, suggests that uh, it was used to justify the acquisition of lands that were recognized to be that of the indigenous people. It was also used as a justification to kill Indians and Indian cultures as obstacles to progress, as obstacles to the manifest destiny of the United States greatness. Um, and I just want to be bring a couple of examples of um, that more horrific um, part of manifest des destiny as, a hi histo as history. Um, one of that is connected with the Indian Removal Act of 1830s, uh, particularly the Trail of Tears, 1838-39, um, um, which was um, initiated by President Jackson, Jackson at the time, um, which revolved around the forced relocation of the Cherokee nations, the most civilized, the ones who have adopted civilized, the, the white ways, um, together with some other southeastern nations from their homeland to, the pre to present day Oklahoma. And if you see on the map, uh, it kind of I tried to map the yellow uh, areas as the um, areas of the trip. Um, families, you can imagine, very young, very old people marched more than 12,000 miles. Um, a lot of that many, uh, a lot of that walk during winter. Uh, history tells us, and narratives by contemporary Native American writers um, um, today tell us that the story that more than that about one in four people die um, died at the time. Again, this was all um, so that um, Indians can be removed from lands, so that these lands could be opened to the greatness of American colonization and to the greatness of the manifest destiny. Um, um, at the time, justifying the Indian Removal Act, President Andrew Jackson, and these are his words, um, spoke um, like that, and I'm quoting, the Indian tribes which occupied the countries now constituting the eastern states were annihilated or have melted away to make room for the whites. He used words kind of suggesting that Indians are disappearing or that, that you know they have to step away to make room for the whites. And people wondered, and uh, he was questioned about whether Indians would miss those lands and whether it's kind of, it's, isn't it cruel to expect that people can resettle so easily? Uh, his response, again, recorded in the historical documents and in the literature is like, is it supposed that the wandering savage has a stronger attachment to his home than the settled, civilized Christian? Um, that's uh, kind of words at the time. And again, it suggests that idea of greatness that um, the civilized Christians have more right to a home that we can't expect from savages, that was the mentality at the time, to be attached to their homes um, and therefore their removal is justified. <coughs> Our own state, the state of Wisconsin, uh, around that, that same time, um, record some of that history. Um, this is a historical, um, you know, and it's available easily online uh, in the historical documents. This is the seal of Wisconsin in 1836. And I was wondering, um, I don't know whether it's very clear, but do you see any particular features of this seal that we could comment on or that remind us of that doctrine uh, manifest destiny? Um, the Indian is right there, and I don't know, I'm so worried of technology, but I can walk over here, 
hopefully it's okay. It's, is it allowed? <laughs> and you can see the Indian with its bows and bow and arrow um, um, certainly is there. Um, um, somebody else? Civilization succeeds barbarism. Is that's exactly what it suggests? And then the idea is that civilization will succeed the Indians who are moving and um, moving away from that land. All of them are looking west, which is the direction of westward expansion at the time, the, the direction of manifest destiny and greatness. And um, again, there is this motto that we kind of, if we, if you remember, if you look at that, that idea that the wandering savages have fewer rights than those of the established Christians. Civilization succeeds barbarism. And it was, again, part of the rhetoric at the time, but it's all kind of um, melded together with the rhetoric of, um, again, the historical narrative of um, American greatness and the supposed inferiority of um, Native Americans at the time. Another example of that doctrine that, um, again, certainly um, is a um, negative, it's a it's, um, um, terrible, terrific fact to remember. Um, manifest dis Destiny was also kind of used as a justification for the Indian boarding schools um, right around the same period of time, um, 1880s, uh, 1930s, um, where, again, um, not only uh, Indian lands were forcibly acquired, but Indian children in some ways were forcibly acquired and uh, schooled into the civilization of um, um, kind of, um, of, of mainstream America. Um, <coughs> the motto of the Indian boarding schools, as you know, by his founder, uh, Richard Pratt, was kill the Indian, save the man. And you can see from these pictures um, um, the, 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 the number of children, the, the kind of the industrialized look that it look that 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 the appearance of that school has, um, where again <coughs> the idea was that um, American culture, the American moral, the American uh, purpose is much higher than that of um, the local tribes, and that <coughs> the only opportunity for Indian kids and for Indians is to become um, civilized Americans, to leave behind their cultures. They are all Indian children from various tribes, uh, all gathered together at Carlisle Indian boarding schools. So many of these children had to travel on train more than hundreds of miles away from their families. Um, some of them as young as um, four years old. Uh, they were taken away. They would uh, return maybe every summer. But the whole idea of the Indian boarding schools was that uh, children are removed from their tribal cultures, right? Uh, they um, denied contact with their families so that they can forget their languages. Um, and again, the idea behind that was I can totally imagine that at that time, um, Indian friends, um, as they call themselves, believe that this is the best solution for um, native kids, right? Um, they have nothing else to hope for but to become Americans. And the sooner they forget tri their tribal cultures, the sooner they become little white kids, um, the sooner they learn to function in that society, the better for them. And that was the idea behind the Indian boarding schools. <coughs> Uh, the results of that is that broke apart Indian cultures, languages, spir spiritualities, and families. Um, certainly some um, positive results could be found there, but the overall overwhelming story of the Indian boarding schools is as um, um, the subtitle of this book that exists uh, is that of global ethnic and uh, of global, uh, sorry, of um, global American ethnic and cultural cleansing. <coughs> Uh, and again, you see another picture which presents that kind of a mass of kids um, educated into, into that um, doctrine. Given these two facts um, that are associated with the term manifest destiny, <coughs> those that come from the alternative history, the history um, narrated by um, American Indian people, the original inhabitants, the indige indigenous inhabitants of this land, it, is no, it comes to no surprise that um, some American Indian activists um, came up with alternative t-shirts. <laughs> it seems like the t-shirt battle of the times. <laughs> um, in some sense, uh, this, this, uh, these were proposed by the indigenous artist Greg Deal at the time. Um, 
Um, and I actually did, could not find whether they really sold or whether he just made them as a provocation or as kind of a um, suggestion. But he was saying, if we are going to have a T-shirt that says Manifest Destiny, we should also proudly, se proudly, or in some sense, have enough T-shirts in the market that says that say American expansionism, Amer Indian removal, forced assimilation, American imperialism, romantic nationalism, mass genocide. Uh, in a sense, Greg da Deal here the indigenous artist, is forcing us to recognize that the story, that the story um, of American history, the story of um, manifest destiny cannot be just one-sided. If we talk about manifest destiny, we also have to confront other aspects of American history as well. Um, and I'll skip over some of those just for the sake of time. So um, having reviewed the, contro the, the controversy that this T-shirt uh, evoked and having indicated the alternative T-shirt models that potentially exist, um, what is the end of that T-shirt story and the end of this T-shirt battle? And obviously, I'm joking here. It's not just about the T-shirts, obviously. It's about revisioning, re-envisioning, recognizing our history. So. Um, December 2012, um, about two and a half months, three months after the release of that T-shirt, uh, Gap did cancel the T-shirt um, after uh, massive protests, more than 3,000 uh, requests from consumers and activists for this shirt to be uh, removed. They canceled the, the shirt with the following apology. Thank you for your feedback regarding the Manifest Destiny t-shirt based on customer feedback. We will no longer offer the t-shirt in our stores or online. The designer also issued an apology saying that it hurts me deeply to be called a racist. A very kind of personal, self-involved um, um, apology at this sense. So, um, is this the end of the story? Does this solve the problem of ignorance of recognizing the dual faces of American uh, history. Um, in some yes, sense, yes and no. And the rest of my lecture is to talk about um, why yes and why no. Having looked at uh, the various comments and controversial responses to the t-shirt story, uh, the one most common comment that I find um, with respect to that controversy in 2012, but the kind of the dialogue continues online, you can imagine. The most common response that I find, usually from non-native people, <coughs> in the comment columns is, oh, this is just fashion. This is a t-shirt for God's sake. Um, uh, when would people stop kind of being so offended by everything? This is just popular culture. Stop being so defensive. Get over it. This happened in the past. Why can't Indians just move on? Uh, and oftentimes we hear the same thing around the mascot debate, and I'm not going to go there, but always the question is just, what is the, what, what is the problem? This is just really a t-shirt. Why do we bother? And I wanted to uh, bring uh, some American literature here to try to answer this question. Why do we bother? Why do I take an hour of your beautiful afternoon to talk about a t-shirt? And, and I don't know uh, whether people would be interested in reading with me, but I brought some photocopies of a passage that I want to uh, share with you. And if you're interested, I will pass these so you can follow along. I don't have too many. I feel so much like a teacher. Students, pass the handout. And I'm a teacher, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I don't have too many, but you could, um, you know, if somebody is interested to read or follow along, and I didn't bring too many. And this comes from this particular book that I brought for show and tell because I think it's very important. It's relatively new um, and it kind of, um, it's one of the examples of the new history and the new literature, everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask and by Anton Tor, um, an indigenous writer. And in the passage that I um, passed and that um, I will try to um, read, um, let me see, it's on one page, page 154. Um, <coughs> And um, this book is organized by kind of questions and answers for Indians. And, <coughs> and the question that he asks here is, um, um, it's a comment that he hears from non-native people usually, um, and it goes like that, I'm not racist, but it all happened in the past. Why can't Indians just move on? Is there somebody who is interested in 
helping me read? Or can I read it along? Okay, I'll read it from here. And it's kind of a relatively long passage, and, but this is how he answers. Historical tra trauma is a complicated subject. It's kind of like this. Someone was hitting the Indian in the head with a hammer for decades, and it did a lot of damage. Now the government is, for the most part, done hitting the Indian in the head with a hammer. But there is still all this damage that takes a very long time to repair. And the government is not interested in repairing the damage. It all happened in the past. So Indians are left to heal themselves. Language and culture loss, many health issues, substance abuse, the educational opportunity gap, lack of economic opportunity, and many other problems in Indian country can be directly attributed to specific government politics and manifest destiny, I will add. It is easy to push, to push people into a pit, but it can be very hard for them to climb back out. Another way to look at this, continues Tror, if a husband cheats on his wife, but then decides he wants to reconcile the relationship and make it work, he cannot say, it all happened in the past, sweetie. Just forget about it. Making peace has to start with him saying, hey, I did you wrong. I'm sorry, and it will never happen again. Then there is a chance that they can reconcile the relationship. That, that is a fair apology to what happened with the US government and the Indian. Instead of cheating in a marriage, the US government used genocidal warfare, residential boarding schools, suppression of religious freedom, and a host of pernicious policies against Indians. But the government has never said that it was wrong, much less apologized, much less tried to make things right. And every time the government comes up with a new English-only law, or ignores the 50% unemployment rate in some Indian communities, or allows a state like Arizona to ban the teaching of ethnic studies in public schools, or tries to renege or renegotiate the promised treaty right, Indians see this as another hammer blow to an ancient wound. The historical baggage and the ongoing damage make it very difficult for Indians to move on, discard anger, forgive or heal. And the fact that most Americans have no understanding of this dynamic makes the struggle all the more frustrating. I apologize for the long quote, but I think it kind of captures that idea of why do we have to bother? Why do we have to pay attention uh, to even the small things? Because again, after historical mistake, after historical trauma, even the small things uh, hurt and um, have massive implications. And I continue asking the question, so what? Where does this discussion take us? <coughs> and it takes us to a classroom. And this is actually uh, Laurentide Hall, where I teach <laughs> um, uh, languages and literatures. It takes me to um, my thinking as a teacher um, um, and my uh, reflection on what my responsibility is um, to educate an audience, uh, to provide two sides to the story and to um, kind of listen and um, provide opportunities for students and for all of us to learn. Um, it takes me to my profession and uh, the reason I teach Native American literature because there are literature in this particular case um, and these are all contemporary Native American writers that I like to teach and that uh, help us see history and the human experience uh, with a different lens, the lens of um, the indigenous people, peoples of these lands. Um, and I brought a couple of stories and books that I want to share um, um, of contemporary writers. <coughs> so it brings us to the role of education and re-educating our audience. Uh, contemporary American writers that I brought, Scott Mamaday, uh, Leslie Marwan Silko, Louise Erdrich, um, Louis Clark III, who is a um, Wisconsinite poet as well, Thomas King, all of them kind of finding ways to um, educate us about the human experience from a Native American point of view through the, through the power of telling a story, not a t-shirt story in this case, but the story of experience. <coughs> um, something else that gives me hope is that um, I have a fourth and fifth grader at home. Um, it gives me hope that in their own school curriculum at um, age 9, 10, 11, um, 
my son has already read two Native American writers, The Birch Bark House by Louis Erdrich and Code Talker by Joseph Bruchak. Um, both um, kind of narrate uh, about the experience of American Indians from the perspective of Native American writers. Uh, it's very gratifying for me to know that uh, when my son read Code Talkers, and it talks about how the Indian boarding schools um, kind of try to eradicate the language from um, um, American Indians from the Navajo in this particular case, the Diné people, uh, then they used that language that remained to create the code talk um, that helped uh, the U.S. Army um, in the Second World War. So my, comment, my son commented, wow, they try to take the, their language away from you, but then they use the language to help the U.S.? Isn't that amazing? And I said, yes, it is very amazing. It's very amazing that you know that <coughs> because um, some of us in the audience, didn't, myself included, did not have the opportunity to learn that when we were 10 and 11. Because um, that history and that knowledge of the US um, alternative story, I think, was not as popular at the time. And I think I have the signal that I am a little bit running um, um, short on time. Um, where does the story take us also is on um, Indian reservations, and it takes us to Native American communities and to schools on Native American reservations as well. And I wanted to show you um, a very short video created by Native American students called We Are More Than That. Um, it was created by Native students in 2010, before the t-shirt story started, but in response to a similar uh, kind of a protest to stories about Native Im Americans that exist and that are circulated in popular culture that emphasize primarily um, kind of a that ignore the Native Americans or emphasize only the negative side of Native American experience such as poverty, alcohol abuse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these stu students, just like I do as an educator, they also wanted to educate an audience, um, an audience that there is another aspect to the story of Native Americans, and I hope that this works. Um, um, and, um, yeah, let me see. So, uh, something created by Native American students. I know what you probably think of us. I saw the special too. Maybe you saw a picture. Picture of poverty. Read an article. An article about violence on Indian reservations. So. But we're here because we want you to know. We're more than that. 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 We have so much more than poverty.
It, it's endearing um, for me to know that uh, this project was um, d done with an um, educator and that um, an educator managed to um, bring those ideas from her students so that um, they can tell their alternative stories. And I certainly hope this gives me a motivation that I do something similar in my own teaching as a literature professor somebody who also tries to educate an audience. Um, I don't think there is a better way to end um, other than uh, with that kind of a positive uh, image and this positive vis video um, that um, today's Native American community, today's uh, American Indian students are much more than um, what we think of them. Uh, that there is again a lot of new stories to um, the story that we are um, that Keep, we have been presenting then the story of the manifest destiny that we started with. And with this, um, I will end. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I apologize for the technological mishaps. I hope you were able to hear and see. Um, I will gladly answer questions or listen to comments if you have uh, things to share. I am happy to pass some of these books if you want to, if you like the touch of books <laughs> and uh, alternative books, or if you would like to pay attention to some book titles. Um, these are books that um, I make my students read <laughs> uh, and that I found um, very educational and also good stories to tell as well. I'll, help I'll leave them here. Um, this is a class, actually, uh, contemporary American Indian literature. For the first time, I taught it last sem last fall. Um, just last fall, languages and um, uh, not languages. UW launched uh, the first minor in Indian studies, and as part of that uh, minor, uh, we have also. Um, higher level American Indian literature course, in addition to introduction to American Indian literature as well. So, yeah. so if you do have questions, um, because we are having microphone issues, if you will just raise your hand and we'll kind of go around and we'll repeat the questions as needed. Does, does anyone have questions here? Questions. Okay. Why don't you, this is a little bit difficult and I can help repeat okay. it. Okay. I think it would be of interest, how many of the people in here have Indian some Indian blood in them. If we held up our hands, I think we'd be surprised. Um, sure. Could everyone hear that question? His question was, how many people in the audience have American Indian blood? And if you could raise your hand. I see two or three, and that was an interesting question. Two or three? Um, I, I saw three people in the audience. Um, do you want to comment on on that? Did you want to comment any further on that? She might not be in here. Here? Someone here? Was there someone here that wanted to comment on that? I to comment, but I belong to a tribe out in Oregon. Okay. So she she's... I'm going to try to have you speak it. I know <laughs> this is a microphone. Just try oh. to, so others can hear you. I belong to a tribe out in Oregon State the uh, Cayuse tribe of the Umatilla Nation. I never lived on the reservation, or my grandmother had a farm there. Yes. Thank you Wonderful. for sharing. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I'm gonna have you just try to ask the question, and then we'll repeat it as needed. This microphone's not very good, so if you wanna just direct it. Conversationally, I'm interested in the appropriate use of Native Americans yeah, that's. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about terminology. So you heard me maybe interchangeably using American Indian and Native American, and just like um, every time we have a contested history, I think terminology becomes an issue. Um, so um, part of the deep ages, if you com conversationally, if you speak about that, uh, some people feel that Native American as a term is something that is academic, coined by academics for academic purposes. Um, and uh, one of the problems with this term, if you hear objections about this, would be that um, it erodes part of the indigenous identity because we would, you know, if you say Native American, it could be almost any American. <coughs> Uh, just in the same way in which would say I'm a native Bulgarian and, and somebody else is a native Canadian and somebody else is a native German. So that was one um, kind of a 
an objection to that, uh, not necessarily an objection, but as you use the term to kind of be aware of what you are enhancing and what you are taking away from that. Um, uh, American Indian, some, some American Indian people would say that they prefer that term because it highlights uh, the historical mistake of Columbus, right? Um, you know, uh, um, so in a sense, it's kind of also a claim to uh, closer to indigenousness. Um, so of course, obviously, if you have to use a term, it's best to use indigenous or call people that by their name. Um, but that, that's part of the debates. Um, I personally called my course when I taught it not Native American literature, but American Indian literature, uh, because I wanted to honor that idea of um, kind of not taking away some sense of indigenousness, right? Uh, many people can, can call themselves Native American with a small n, obviously, if you're just a Native American, um, a native of the United States. Um, and I thought American Indian has uh, preserves a little bit more history. But you can hear the debate. Uh, it's oftentimes a, a matter of kind of a choice that you make. But yeah, it's a contested term. It's a, <laughs> a story of ter terminology, too. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions in the audience? Sure, why don't you go ahead and she can repeat. I still. Oh, sorry, somebody. Um, Let's go back here. Do you want to go to the front first and then? Do you mind? Oh, sure. You, you, ladies first, yes. I still don't <laughs> to the Indians, and every so often they send me little prizes because I do events. And I have bought Thank you for the two big dolls dressed in their beautiful leather clothes. Yes. Uh, go to school, help them eat mm -hmm. money, uh, eat uh, food and all things like that. Sure, yes. Uh, thanks for doing that. And again, um, we have to acknowledge that as a result of the history that I tried to gloss over very quickly, uh, there is certainly, I mean, historical trauma, trauma and historical difficulties on Indian reservations. Poverty is certainly among them. Uh, Native Americans or American Indian tribes continue to be um, kind of among the most impoverished communities in the United States. Um, I also like that idea of the people giving back uh, because um, if you think about tribal economies are economies of gift and of gift exchange and of kind of um, showing that. So it's kind of a good reminder of that as well, that we have a different, um, a different economical basis there, that of gifting, <laughs> just the vision. Uh, I, what was that? I do not have that list. I'm not. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. You know, I um, um, yeah. Um, uh, certainly, there were historic. There is historical records of the original inhabitants from again from narratives of you know, and we certainly know that there were many more tribes and many more languages than there are today. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Let's take the question answer. back yeah, here and then we can here. go in the front too. Yeah, go ahead. I have a daughter who did the DNA testing. Sure. And come to find out much of her heritage, of course, was Europe. But there's a little spot in the Carolinas where there is some Native American uh, ancestry for her. Also, I wonder, you often, you spoke of apologizing. We should apologize. Who, from whom should an apology come and how can we make a sincere apology to the Native Americans? This is, uh, I don't know whether I necessarily have the answer, but I think we certainly can brainstorm. Again, um, um, I think, um, I don't know what people think. I certainly have an answer. Um, and when I say we, I don't mean that uh, ancestors of people, that we have to feel responsible and guilty for what the government did. I certainly no, am not suggesting that. Uh, but I think that we have to own our history and know our history and recognize it. I personally think that an apology should come from the government. Uh, what part of the government? What, of the government? Um, um, what do people think? I certainly think that, um, you know, um, The government is very nebulous. I think it's very easy for a president to offer an apology, but as far as I know, uh, no president has offered an apology for a formal recognition of history. But again, um, 
I'm not here to lecture on a sense of guilt. I just really want to emphasize the importance of being educated and recognizing, um, recognizing, uh, recognizing the um, recognizing histories. One of the writers that I send, The Truth About Stories, um, he writes uh, in his book, if somebody's holding this, it's Thomas King. And in his book, in every chapter, he tells a story and then he ends its chapter and he says, this is the story that I told you. This is your story. Do whatever you want with it. Forget it, throw it away. But now that I have told you this story, it is yours. And you cannot go on living your life telling telling yourself that I didn't tell you. And the whole idea is that, um, you know, this is a story, you know, you, you, oh, you, know, you, you cannot pretend, you cannot, you cannot, we cannot claim manifest ignorance. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to suggest, that it's important to know the stories and what we do with them, what do we, I mean, do we go tell the president to apologize? I don't know. Sometimes the point is, now you know the story. Do whatever you want with it, but don't go around, tell people, I'm sorry, I didn't know about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know about that. Um, and I think that was the point of my lecture as well. And thank you for bringing um, you know, that point of you know, who. I, I don't have all the answers either, right, obviously. Professors, professors never have all the answers. That's, after, that's where we begin. Um, thank you. Well, I was just on that point. I was Tribes did have the right to spearfish, and of course the sportsmen weren't happy with that. But also part of that was that all of the school systems had to teach about the Native American uh, culture in their area and in Wisconsin. And so that's helped the younger generation. Absolutely. It's not helping our generations that Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yes, you're talking about Act 31, which was one of the settlements for the spearfishing here in, this, in Wisconsin. So it's, it's, it's very proud <laughs> to be here in Wisconsin because we have one of few states, not so many, who have Act 31, at least a document that requires that um, in the curriculum, there are twice, I think, that we have to teach about uh, Native Americans. Once in elementary school, hence my son right in fourth and fifth grade learning about Am American Indians and in high school as well so it's a mandated thing it's a little bit difficult for Act 31 to be enforced but I think you know there is uh, there is very well developed curriculum on that so that if teachers decide to do that there are whole websites with very thorough lesson plans um, and you know um, teachers are doing doing that you know moving yeah, on with that yes Absolutely, I agree, and again, that's, um, you know, I, I definitely think that there is a very positive end to these stories, and that, again, I really think that when I talk about manifest ignorance, I c kind of um, talk about this kind of residual pretense, I would say, in the culture that allows us to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know, I didn't mean to do harm, and um, I think that there is a responsibility to get educated about fundamental facts in the history of this country, and that's the whole point. Thank you for bringing this up. I was going to bring the uh, Act 31 somewhere, uh, and you helped me with that. I really appreciate that. We have time for probably uh, one more question or so, if anyone yep. has one more question. Mm -hmm. Anyone anywhere? Sure. Oh, sure. Um, so this was a question about Indian gaming and whether, I guess, casinos help and have impact, Indian gaming in general. Um, from what I know, and again, when we talk about Indians, and that's the problem with generalizations, which we always rely on <coughs> to make um, broad sweeping claims, but um, it can vary from tribe to tribe. But in general, um, the gaming industry um, has helped native communities reinvest back in the community. Um, I would like to think that native communities have other means to generate revenue. I would like to think that gaming and casinos are not the only way. Uh, but in this particular p moment, from what I know, again, a lot of the revenues that come from um, casinos get reinvested back in education, back in the community. And many native activists argue that this should not be the way, this is not a sustainable way to develop 
uh, a community to develop um, revenue that there are you know other ways in which um, that could be done and should be done. I also know that many native, some native tribes use revenues from casinos to purchase back tribal lands, um, and um, in some sense there is. Uh, you know, that kind of uh, adopting the mechanisms of market economy and uh, trying to get back what is possible in this particular case. I don't, I, again, it's a much larger question, and I apologize for making generalizations, but yes, certainly that's one direction. Well, and one perspective on that was if you missed our lecture last week, we had uh, uh, someone from the Ho Chunk Nation talk a little bit about that in his in his talk about how they're using the the casinos to reinvest in the community. That's just one mm -hmm. one tribe's story, but that lecture is online if, yes. if anyone missed that and you can sort of see what the Ho-Chunk's yes. response to that was. And again, that's a trend with all tribes that have casinos. Not all tribes have that. No, not all tribes have um, kind of big revenues from that. But also uh, in the Milwaukee, Milwaukee urban community, for example, I know that uh, Milwaukee has one of the best Native American Indian schools um, in the area with um, kind of really huge effort to um, revive language, to revive traditions. And that fabulous school um, is supported by um, casino revenue, casino money, uh, you know, gaming revenues as well. So um, again, that's, that's one example of um, I'm not advocating for people going gambling, thinking that they do good things for the Indians. But um, that's a, a one way in which uh, that, that, that gets get reinvested. And this Indians. gentleman back here noted that one of the books you passed around uh, made reference to the petroleum industry as well. Yes, uh, if you looked at um, everything you wanted to know about Indians, that's certainly one that uh, made reference to that. And I don't know which other one, but certainly, yes, there are there are many issues, many, you know, uh, the, the, the history of, a, of the country is complicated. And as long as we don't simplify it, as long as we remember that there are two stories to the history of the United States, um, and, it re you know, dig deeper, I think we are in a, in a good start. Yeah, the, uh, the Menominees uh, are, are very big in the forestry mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. in Absolutely, and they particularly in terms of sustainable practices and practices that certainly draw on traditional ways of taking care of uh, trees. Certainly, that's a very, very nice, interesting, different story. Um, and I think on that point, um, it's a good place to leave um, the Q&A, but if you do have some questions for Dr. Ivanova, she, she's here with her books to share, and, uh, and we'll stay a bit to, to answer any questions. But thank you all for coming and, and joining us for the lecture today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Very delightful audience.